Well, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to leave the high living and low thinking of Dallas, Texas <laughs> and come up here to the low living and high thinking of Bethel. Uh, God sent me to Texas 30 years ago and the only explanation I've got is that I must have had an awful lot of sins <laughs> to go there. But I really am delighted to be here for a number of quick reasons. One is, I taught for a period at Seattle Pacific. And that was one of the happiest periods of my teaching that I've had. And so I've got a soft spot for all of these wonderful small uh, Christian colleges that are scattered throughout the United States. I think they're really marvelous places to be. And further, I'm convinced that these colleges have a pivotal role in the ecology, what I'm going to call the ecology of education within the United States. As you know, we do not have them in Europe. Uh, we Methodists built two superb schools, one in Belfast and one outside Dublin. Uh, we also built an agricultural college, but there was no way you would have the resources to develop what, in fact, you have at a place like Bethel and elsewhere. And even though these colleges are small in terms of, say, the state universities, University of Texas has, what, 52,000 students? I mean, I don't know how you have enough toilets for people like that. <laughs> but we punch above our weight, if I can put it that way, in terms of these colleges. And I think the significance is not tied to size. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to speak for about 50 minutes or so. If we need to take a break, then we'll open it up for questions. And um, I'm really going to live out of, I'll mention this in my preliminary comments, my own journey both as a Wesleyan, as a Methodist, and as a scholar, and as a teacher. So it's not that that always will be explicit, but I see myself as basically formed and shaped in that world, and will therefore speak out of it. But I want to begin with a biblical text. Philippians chapter 4, 8. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, I think that's a text that we ought to take into all of our education. In fact, into our wider engagement of the culture, I like to start off with what, in fact, is there here that is absolutely pure and holy and that we can draw on so that we start off on the right foot. I, I love this text in terms of a kind of background piece of music, and it's going to be my background piece of music for what I have to say today. Further, as I've already indicated, what I want to say is a reflection my own journey up to and into the world of higher education. Now, I was sent to school when I was three and a half years of age. My father was killed in a very bad road accident. My mother was left with six boys. And I was a complete disaster. I mean, I once threatened the babysitter to kick her shins with my hobnail boots. I can still remember that, and I got a good cuffing around the year for that. So I was brought up in a world where, if you like, at the age of three and a half, I went to school, fell in love with the teacher, and could never leave. I was also brought up as a Protestant, but anti-Christian. I pause there, because it reflects, actually, now as I look back on it, a transition in Irish culture, which has reached a very interesting sort of climactic turn in the last several months, in which I was sort of the first generation which was turning its back on Christianity. That's to say, we kept the Protestant identity because it was political and it was ethnic. But as far as our relationship to Christianity was concerned, we want nothing to do with it. We did not want anything to do with Jesus. Jesus was just the great interferer that you wanted to keep out of your life. And whereas my parents, for example, they would simply go along with the church and not be antagonistic to the church, they had become anti-Christian. Happily, my mother found faith before she died. But that anti-Christian spirit was in the air, and most in my generation have walked. And in fact, one of the biggest things that we've got to face in Ireland is how is Ireland going to be re-evangelized? because it's a really, really tough mission field. Now, I got converted when I was in my teens and got converted in my local church. Wonderful, right? Exactly the right place where you should be converted. 
And out of that, in, in, I found myself having this amazing intellectual awakening. For example, I read Wesley and didn't know that I was supposed to be bored reading John Wesley. <laughs> now, when I went to seminary, Wesley died on me, totally died on me. And it was not until afterwards I was working in a church in, in the north of Ireland. And I used to love it when I got sick. Because when I got sick, I didn't have to visit people. And I could go to bed and I could read. <laughs> And I had stolen, forgive me, Lord, I had stolen a set of tapes by Albert Outler on John Wesley. Now, I've spent a fair bit of time dismantling what Outler has been arguing about Wesley, but that's neither here nor there. And what Outler did, because he had this brilliant sort of historical perspective on the 18th century, is he gave me back my Wesley. And so what's happened is that I went through this amazing intellectual awakening when I came to faith. By the way, the standard thing for people in my generation, when I was growing up in my family, was that, in fact, well, on the weekends was the weekends to go dancing, then the next thing was a shotgun wedding, and that was the end of your education. <laughs> what happened to me was that I fell in love with learning and couldn't get bored reading this stuff, so here I am. My initial desire was to be a teacher. In the north of Ireland, where I was brought up, there were two people, that, two groups that were seen as central in the community. One was the doctors, the other was the teachers. <laughs> and so I really wanted to be a teacher. And then I had a call into the ministry. And that was a really tough thing for me. <laughs> um, I'd become something of a befuddled atheist. <laughs> I had a bad dose of what I sometimes call intellectual measles. And I decided, again, you'll see the Wesley underwear here. John Wesley wouldn't go to the toilet if he didn't have a reason. I decided that I would think about uh, leaving the church, having no longer come to believe in any of this, or whatever was there was a vestige of it. I'd think about it for three months. And that was a very dangerous thing to do. And within three months, I'd come initially back to convictions about the reality of the divine. Next thing, I got mugged by the Incarnation. And any of you know the great Wesley hymns on that are just out of this world. And then I had a call to the ministry, and as far as I was concerned, there were two genders, male and female, and ministers, and I knew which one I was, and I was not going down that road. <laughs> so it was a very difficult transition for me, A, to give up my desire to be a teacher, and then, in fact, to take up the work of the ministry of the church. And here's the irony of it all. I got it all back. And on top of that, I got to be a scholar. <laughs> So I don't know. If we're bored, I, I don't understand it. We can't be bored with this kind of world. Now, just further quick comment on this. I see myself as living in the cracks. And this will probably come out in some of the impish things I may want to say in the course of the day. On the one hand, I live between Ireland and England. So actually, I have an Irish passport and I've got an English passport. <laughs> Depends which part of the world you're going to, which one you use. I also live in the cracks between Europe and North America. One of the things I love to do is try and think through, are the transitions in Europe going to be repeated over here? And I think that's a question that all of us need to think about. I live also in the cracks between philosophy and theology and history. And I think those are the three greatest disciplines in the history of the world. I know you think differently, but that's where I am. And then I live in the cracks between the academy and the church. Now, I don't tell this to very many people, but I have my own mission organization. And we work actually, we've worked in Kazakhstan, uh, we've worked in Nepal. In fact, the work in Nepal has become so big, we've had to hand it over to some other people. And currently, I'm engaged, in fact, in the establishment of a new Methodist church in Romania, of all places. <laughs> so uh, if you think that uh, 24 hours in a day are short for someone like myself, you're, you're really correct about that. But I just love, I love all of the range of activities that we are engaged in and can do. And I'll just live in the cracks between those. Now, one other longer preliminary comment. I've had two extraordinary teachers across the years. I'm sure you have too, maybe more than that. One was Basil Mitchell of Blessed Memory, who was a professor of philosophy at Oxford. <laughs> Very interesting figure. And the other was a total unknown at Asbury Seminary called Robert Trainer. Uh, Robert Trainer taught biblical studies. Um, in fact, he gave orders for his, I don't know how many um, boxes of notes to be burned. And I have threatened with a friend of mine to go in and steal them 
so that they don't get burned. That's a moral question I'm not going to get into here. <laughs> but Robert Trina had this aphorism that I want to just play with for a minute as we move forward. <laughs> Trina said to me one day, he said, Billy, he said, there are no problem-free situations. Now, some of these problems are internal to disputes and squabbles within Christianity itself. <laughs> And some of them have to do with squabbles that arise and how we relate to the culture that we, in fact, inhabit. And I think it's very important that as, um, as we work our way through the problems, that you realize that as soon as you fix one set of problems, another set of problems are going to arise. So there's going to be no problem-free situation wherever you are. And if you think there's a promised land out there, let me know when you find it because I've been looking for a long time. Now, let me put it in terms again, briefly, of my own journey here. Uh, I started out with this challenge for Christianity, namely, Christianity is intellectually subpar. It's not up to speed. Um, in my local high school, for example, we were reading and listening to John Robinson, Honest to God, that'll date you if you know about that. We had it on the radio, and in fact, very early on, um, I've lived with this central issue. What are we going to do about articulating, not just the content of the Christian faith, that's crucial, but how are we going to articulate a viable, robust defense of the truth of the Christian faith where we are in our current situation? Now, that's a problem that I've lived with and worked with and love. I'll stay up to 2 o'clock in the morning worrying about that issue. <laughs> but then I got to Perkins. And for my sins, as I say, God sent me to Texas. <laughs> and apart from the heat, the first thing I discovered was that an older generation of faculty were interested in questions about the credi credibility of Christianity, but a whole new generation that was emerging were not. <laughs> that the worry that had emerged was not Christianity is false. The worry was Christianity is poisonous. Christianity is bad for women, for minorities, and in fact for all of those who were sort of drifted off to the margins and to the underside of history. Now, I, I actually sort of, uh, I'm a pretty affable individual, so, you know, I just settled down. I'm living in Texas. I've got to figure out this world, so I thought I'd figure out this one. But it's not easy. Now, the way we teach systematics at Perkins is you have two professors who, in the course of a year, lay out the full content of the Christian faith. It's, a, it's I think, one of the best ways to teach systematics anywhere. It's, I would take it over against Harvard, Yale, Chicago, anywhere. But that's another story. So just to give you a sense of how dramatic and shocking it was for me to move into that world, I was teaching with a colleague. And we did our normal thing. I gave a lecture, two lectures, she gives two lectures. And then normally what happened is you talk to one another. So I, you know, raised a question on our Q&As. And next thing I was told, you've had your turn, you white European males. You need to shut up and listen. Now what are you going to do? There's an interesting challenge for you if you're a professor or a teacher. And there's there's a hundred students sitting out there <coughs> listening to this. Now, you've got to make a split-second decision as to what you're going to do when you're hit with something like that. <laughs> right? And I decided I would simply zip it, because I didn't trust my tongue. <laughs> but I knew exactly what I wanted to say. And this, you'll see my underwear coming through here. <laughs> you know, Ireland is a wart on the rear end of Europe. <laughs> Forgive my graphic analogy. <laughs> And frankly, we've been kicked around for a long time, whether you're in the north or whether you're in the south. When I was in England, in fact, I would go to the post office to send stuff back to the north of Ireland, and they thought it was a foreign country. So I said to myself, you know, you may work with that interesting sort of overview of where I'm coming from, but I said to myself, you know, I did not come from Ireland to be told to shut up by a white, middle-class, bourgeois feminist, however intelligent she may be. But you notice I didn't say it, I now report it. Now, what I want to get at here is that, in fact, there's been this sea change in the worries about the content of the Christian faith. 
And their central objection has been, fundamentally, that we're bad for people, that Christianity is bad for people. Now, if you want somebody who's really, I think, pursued this with uh, enormous care, there are two people, actually. One, both of them are dear friends of mine. One is Ellen Cherry, uh, who's a convert, for, by the way, from Judaism, and you won't hear that unless you know her. Um, a remarkable conversion narrative, which is as dramatic as St. Paul. And the other is Sarah Coakley. Now, Sarah Coakley went to Harvard. She went to Harvard because they thought that she would be good to do feminism. She was a student of Trulsh. And as Gordon Kaufman put to me, she then decided to do feminism by the study of the fathers. Now, think of that. And she's now escaped back to England. But her work, more recent work, has just been phenomenal, in my judgment, in dealing with this. And uh, I tease her when I see her that she's the new Gregory of Nazianzus for us because you're going to save the doctrine of the Trinity from the most powerful objections that have been made against it in our day and generation. Namely, I think the objection that, in fact, this is indeed uh, the, the central problem is not the truth of Christianity initially, but in fact that Christianity is poisonous. Now, um, having come to Perkins, I've survived, as you can see. And I would now say that as I look at the academy more broadly, I think there are two challenges that I want to sort of flag, and then I'm going to get into more specifics. I think the quest for credibility and rational justification, uh, while I think it's a very important one, is now actually sidelined, except for certain circles, which I'm going to mention later on. We live in a, what's often seen as a postmodern world, where reason is tradition relative, class relative, power relative, and gender relative. And that's going to call for its own particular deep response. And as uh, you probably realize it, I'm not the one to give it, as you're going to see because of my own interests elsewhere. Although I do want to tell you, I, I've just, I'm a series editor. You know, you, you get books in the mail. Don't you get books in the mail? And I got this book in the mail. I thought, why are they sending this to me? And then I looked at the general editors, and in fact, my name is at the top of the list. <laughs> I'd clean forgotten that I'd signed on to this. But in fact, this is a very interesting text, um, uh, because I, I mentioned it. It's Theology and Literature After Postmodernity. And for those of you who are sort of in that world, I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting text dealing with the postmodern challenge, with, uh, 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 with Milbank, for example, being a key player, and, uh, and Rowan Williams being a plea, plea care. But uh, I just want to say uh, it's clear that uh, that issue of uh, how we negotiate these changes intellectually are, are very important. And uh, my own interest in this is in the area of the philosophy of history. And in fact, this fall, I'm teaching a course with a radical feminist from Germany on the uh, history of Israel, how we're going to handle what, what's the history of Israel and how we're going to handle the changes from modern to postmodern historical investigation. So I'm interested in all of that, but I think that's out there as a crucial issue. And then the other crucial challenge, tell it not in Gath, relates to human sexuality as highlighted by, of course, the crucial decision by the Supreme Court on gay marriage. Now, I'll, I'll return to that in, in, in a moment later on. Now, I, what I want to get at here, this is this long-winded uh, sort of uh, comment on there are no problem-free situations. Part of what we've got to do is keep our nerve. I think it's absolutely crucial that Christians and Christian intellectuals keep their nerve. And that means that we avoid what Karl Barth once called the, our dreamy conservative instincts, that we don't get swept into a world of pessimism, of a purely defensive mentality, a mentality of fear and suspicion, and that we don't answer in kind. Uh, I, I think the Christian tradition has a vital part to play in actually keeping our nerve and, and, and exercising intellectual virtue in response to these difficulties, and there are more I'm going to get to in a minute. I think the second issue related to these, these problems is how do we preserve the treasures of the Christian tradition in this sort of constantly changing world? Now, your president mentioned this, and I'm not going to take it any further here, but I quote a wonderful passage from earlier. I quoted from Philippians 4, and then Paul says, Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard 
and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, if there's one legacy I want to leave among, if, if I ever get to leave a legacy, the one legacy I want to leave is that by the time I'm finished my life is that I will have stood for the retrieval and re-articulation of the full treasures of the Christian tradition. I think that is absolutely crucial, whatever problem situation we find ourselves in. And then the other sort of sub the other question I want to raise on the other side of no problem free situation is this. Uh, I'm billed actually to speak about teaching. I really want to speak at the end about education. Now, I think there's a, a wonderful work that's being done on this, and I'm going to give you a Reader's Digest version of it when I get to there. <laughs> but I think it's very, very important that universities and pr professors in universities and staff in universities really have a robust, articulate notion of what it is to educate someone over against, say, indoctrinating someone or training someone. <laughs> now, you can see my work as an analytical philosopher coming through here, and that, I think, is vital as we move forward. Now, I'm doing in threes. I don't know, the Trinity may have gotten to me. <laughs> I want to mention quickly three challenges that I see <laughs> in our current culture, and I want you to identify your own. <laughs> I sort of, earlier I was doing a kind of hang glider account, sort of more bi autobiographically. Now I want to just say, here's what I see on the horizon, and I think they've got to, they've got to get our attention. <laughs> One is very simply the challenge of the new atheism. <laughs> Now, I was taught by the older atheists, like Isaiah Berlin. Um, I've said often, if Isaiah Berlin's not in heaven, I'm going to the complaints department. <laughs> and sort of logic and complaint against the Almighty if Isaiah doesn't get in. I threatened to call my youngest child Isaiah, and Muriel vetoed it very wisely, and we called him Sean. But I'm thinking of a network of people for whom, for example, the Greeks were the heroes and heroines. And the beauty of the Greeks was, you know, we'll pay our dues to the, the divinities that are out there. <laughs> you know, we'll make a sacrifice here or there. We won't get our underwear in a twist, you know. Uh, but on private, in private, <laughs> we will be scatological in our critique of religion and in particular of Christianity. <laughs> now, the new network that's emerged is, of course, those that we recognize as Dawkins and Dennett and Harris and Hitchens and company, and interestingly, Philip Pullman, who set out to, in fact, underline the work of that lapsed Irishman called C.S. Lewis. So the move, actually, to move into a, both an aggressive mode in the public sphere and into the world of the imagination, those of you who teach the literature can pick this up, I think that's a very important move. Now you say, aren't you exaggerating? Uh, yes, these people are aggressive, they're militant, and they're evangelistic. No, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, one of the things I'm currently working with is with a high school, a school in a private school in North Carolina, a first-rate uh, school. And what they've done, they've done a terrific job in uh, grounding their youngsters in the Christian faith. They get to the University of North Carolina, and you end up in the classes of Bart Ehrman, who's a relatively sort of soft and gracious and generous soul. He's the only man I know who can write an autobiography and get his pension fund taken care of forever. Only in America could you tell the story of your deconversion and make a fortune out of it, right? And, and many of these students cannot survive when they get to the state universities. Now, I think, therefore, we've got to have our wits about us, and I'll return in a moment in the resources that we can use to, to, to deal with this. But I think we've got to equip our students for a much more aggressive posture towards the Christian faith in our culture in the immediate future. The second challenge that I'm going to mention, and again, it's person relative, is the challenge of Islam. Now, I have no interest in some sort of fear-mongering about Islam. Um, Islam is a very complex religion, and it's, it's uh, easily, you can divide it up into three groups. You've got the sort of mainstream standard Islam, and you've got the fascinating network of reformers and liberal figures that have emerged within Islam. And then, of course, and this is where the Irish background becomes important, you've got radical Islam, which will give you a full-scale theological defense of terrorism. 
I mean, no holes barred. Now, the challenge as I see it is not necessarily that end of it. I, I'm going to leave that to the, to the uh, politicians in the Defense Department. But here's the issue, and it's emerged in Europe with a vengeance. If, if you go on YouTube or you, or you go to the universities there or you show up in various parts of the country, the challenge to Christians to defend, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity is very well orchestrated and very well organized and it is very, very well, and, and well done. Now, the importance of Islam at this stage, in my judgment, is that here you have a full-scale, robust theistic religion which thinks that we commit idolatry, where we have absolutely screwed up as far as the, who Jesus is, uh, and where they are not going to just sit on their hands and simply say, well, it doesn't matter. I think that uh, the challenge here intellectually is an extremely important one, and I hope that we are up to speed in order to deal with it. Um, could say more about that. Um, if you really want to see the liberal form of Islam in its most fascinating form, I would recommend to you the writings of Tariq Ramadan. Now, Ramadan is the grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain, in, in, excuse me, in Egypt. Very interesting background. Um, and he's a full-scale revisionist, a bit like 19th century liberal Protestants. And uh, just to give you a sense of uh, the, the shifts that are going on in there, he says Sharia is not law, it's the way, which gives you flexibility then in the appropriation of the Islamic tradition. And B, he says, you make the historical relativist move, that in fact we need to take the issues of women, democracy and whatnot, and realize that Islam is going through transitions and, and therefore we'll be, we'll be able to, to make the adjustments. So the third thing he's done, which I think is very interesting if you follow him, he's a rock star, by the way, with a, a, a chair at Oxford and I don't know where else. Uh, I again wish I had his royalties. Uh, but he's also said, look, we're going to make scholars the true interpreters of the Quran. Now, what that does then is it sort of opens up a whole other conversation about how you're going to do your hermeneutics and how you're going to do your interpretation of the text. Uh, the point I want to get at here is that we now have in our midst, and again, maybe this reflects my more my British background, we have now got in our midst a really robust theistic alternative to Christianity. And they are going to convert our children and grandchildren. Not many of them, but they're going to do it. Uh, Tony Blair's sister-in-law, uh, has become a Muslim. He's one of the prized witnesses in a kind of revivalist movements in the United States for Islam. And it's a very attractive op uh, proposition given the muddle-headedness and the confusion within the Christian tradition in the West. Islam offers you a wonderfully simple, straightforward form of theism uh, uh, which, which will give you an identity in the midst of the hardline secularism which we also have had to deal with. So I want to mention that. And then, finally, to return to one I've already mentioned, uh, I, want, I want to say that uh, the, the third major uh, development that we've got to deal with is the issue of sexuality, the changing visions of sexuality, now brought to a head in the, um, in the Supreme Court decision. Now, I'm going to come at that initially as a philosopher, and what fascinates me initially is the changing conception of marriage that's in play. What's at stake here, you know, you, we can argue about, you know, are you going to have, if you're a bakery, you have this big case in Belfast, uh, will, you, will, you, will you bake cakes for gay couples who come in? We have a pastor in Belfast right now who's on trial uh, by the state um, for making disparaging remarks about Islam. It's very interesting. Um, and, of course, this now could well become the case, as we know it is elsewhere in Canada, for example, as to what's going to happen with respect to the issues related to marriage. Now, I think the key issue here is a shift in social ontology. Now, that's just a grandiose way of saying our conception of the entities that make up our social life is sort of undergoing, in the case of marriage, in two shifts that I think are very important. I would say it's a shift initially from marriage constituted by a vision of natural and divine order. And this is why, by the way, 
if Christians think they're the only ones who are going to defend marriage, they're simply, we're silly. <laughs> there are lots of folk who are going to defend marriage from the secular side, although you won't hear too much about them. But a vision of the natural and divine order to what I would call a marriage is constituted by a social contract relative to person relative metaphysics about the meaning and existence of life. Now, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Now, if you want to see this, just read the extremely interesting judgment uh, by Justice Kennedy. Go back to the, go to the Supreme Court uh, debates. And it's very obvious that what's going on here is that you've got now a vision of marriage as a social contract related to your person relative metaphysics or system of meaning. It's no longer a self-evident issue whatsoever. The only idea of this being self-evident is gone. Now, that shift in conception and social ontology seems to me to be one that we've got to really think about. And then the other side of this, and I, I hear I pay tribute to my own beloved teacher, Basil Mitchell, what's at stake now is it looks as if the state, through the Supreme Court, is going to embody that second conception of marriage at the very heart of our public life. Now, you can put this in terms, well, you know, uh, Justice Roberts puts it in terms of the uh, who are we to make these changes? You know, what, five judges, not a single Protestant on the bench, and so on and so forth. I, I don't want to get into that sort of detail. What interests me is this, is that the Supreme Court has endorsed one particular vision of marriage, the second vision of marriage, and underwritten it. And then the question that we've now got to wrestle with is what are going to be the consequences of that over the next 20 to 30 and to 40 and 50 years. And this is going to require enormous patience and compassion and care as we think it through. Because we're going to have to go back to the drawing board on the relationship between morality and law, the relationship between religion, Christianity, theology, law and morality, and our position in the public square. And uh, I, I think that it's an extremely interesting sort of, sort of set of issues, and it's got to be, it's got to be addressed and worked through. And, and we've got to sort of deal with it in a way where we're not simply playing off the back foot and where we're really committed to what I called earlier a deeply robust vision of the Christian faith. So here, there's the, the three crucial issues intellectually that I see in play. And you make up your own list, by the way. This is just person relative. I, I think the challenge of the new atheism I don't want to overstate it because many of them are paranoid and they need a recall in philosophy, especially Harris. Uh, Dennett has no clue about what's happened in philosophy of religion over the last 30 to 40 years. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty awful stuff. But, uh, you know, that's not going to stop it being out there. So that is, I think, a challenge. But it's more when that begins to work its way into more aggressive attitude to students in the public square. And then I think the challenge of Islam um, is, is, is really important. And uh, as you can know, I, I got myself a new suit here. Uh, my Sunday school, t t on Sunday, I teach two Sunday school classes on Sunday morning, and they addressed me as Chairman Mao, which I thought was very nice. <laughs> I got myself a new suit. But I've just come back from Malaysia, and it's very interesting to see what's happening over there. But we've got to work it through in terms of our own context here, in terms of that challenge. And then I think the challenge on the transition in, on the issue, whole debates about sexuality and marriage, that transition is here, here to stay, and we've got to think through what we're going to do that. And it's got to be done by the best minds in the church. We, we cannot leave this to the idiots. We cannot leave this to the, to the folk where the S factor is really high, the stupidity factor. This requires hard, grinding slog of work, says he. Now, three new resources that I've seen. You know, the lovely thing about coming to the last quarter of your career and contemplating overtime, right? Uh, the lovely thing is you've been around long enough to see people sort of change and your culture change, but you've also been around long enough to be able to identify resources that were not available when I started out in the 70s. So I want to mention three of these. Now, the one, I think, is the revolution in, in epistemology and philosophy out of the 1970s. Um, when I was a student, forgive the nostalgia, I could not get anybody to teach me philosophy of religion. When I got to Oxford in the early 70s, 
the whole situation was sort of like changing so dramatically, it was hard for us to, to keep up. And there are two key players, two or three key players that I'll mention. One was Basil Mitchell and then Richard Swinburne. Mitchell was too nice. You know, I'd advice to you if you want to get anywhere as a, as a public intellectual, don't be nice. Uh, have a radical thesis, repeat it endlessly, even though it's an error, <laughs> and write seven books that are going to cover the territory from one end to the other, and don't be gracious and nice and civilized. <laughs> they will not listen to you. They will listen to McIntyre rather than Mitchell, right? They'll listen to a lapsed Irishman rather than a wonderfully sedate Labrador Anglican who is a saint. But what happened at Oxford in late 60s, 70s, a revolution, which I'll come back to in a minute. And the other side of it was Alvin Plantinga, St. Alvin down the road, and Nick Waldersdorf, and what they did at Calvin and at Notre Dame in the, from the 1980s onwards. Now you say, you're really sort of pleading your own discipline at this stage. Well, yes, I am, all right? But here's why I think it's interesting. What happened in the 70s was a massive shift in epistemology. Now, as you know, epistemology is a very serious disease, and if you get it, there's no cure for it, so don't get it. And the classic debate is about whether you're going to be a foundationalist or a non-foundationalist. It shows up in the postmodern literature as well. And it's interesting, it's Christian philosophers and intellectuals who, for the most part, either invented that language, that's how good this was, or, in fact, they were able to extend that debate in ways that is extraordinary. You can put the shift in terms of an epistemological shift away from classical foundationalism, not moderate foundationalism, I'll let you ask about that later, a shift from that to a whole range of epistemological options which I'm going to rattle off, right, like a laundry list. For example, there was the development of what's called particularism. Now, particularism is opposed to Methodism of the small m. Methodism with a small m says you don't know anything until you get the right method and the right criteria. <laughs> Great paper by Chisholm on this. <laughs> but the problem with Methodism is how do you know you got the right method? And if you need a method to get the right method, then you're on to an infinite regress and it'll blow up in your face. But that doesn't stop philosophers keeping going down that road. I'm a radical particularist. My problem is I know too much. I know Ireland is an island. I know I had cancer last year. I know I'm a dog breeder of English Cocker Spaniels. We've just had eight pups. I know my name is Billy Abraham, on and on and on. The problem is I don't know how I know all this. So the shift away from skepticism as a default position is an absolutely pivotal shift in the philosophical world that I've grown up in. Now, there are other ways in which you can get at this, and I'll just, you can put it in terms of externalism or in terms of reliabilism. Um, or in terms of virtue epistemology, or what I myself prefer as agency epistemology. Now, the core idea there is really crucial for Christians, I think. The core idea is this. Human beings are extraordinary, right, truth-detecting organisms. We're a bit like dogs and thermometers. My dog knows when I hit the backyard, and everybody in the house knows about it, right? It doesn't have a method and it doesn't have the criteria of assessment for its perception. A mechanism like a thermometer will tell you what the temperature in the room is if, in fact, it's properly constructed and well made. Now, I myself am convinced that the new work in virtue epistemology and in externalism and so on, the varieties in play here, gives us a tremendous foothold for a Christian vision of human beings made in the image of God. We're these extraordinary, delicate instruments um, with a conscience and with capacities and skills, which, of course, have been uh, riddled with error in certain respects due to the fall. But it, that shift in epistemology, in my judgment, which is not sufficiently well known in theology, above all places, is, it seems to me, absolutely crucial. Now, I'll give you four phases of this development, and then I'll, and then I'll move on. When I started out, I love to be able to do this now, in the 60s, <laughs> I couldn't get anybody to teach me philosophy of religion. The only person who would teach me philosophy of religion was an anti-Christian humanist who had lost his sight in the last week of the war and came to Belfast and taught ethics. An absolutely wonderful teacher. And uh, I got him to teach me philosophy of religion. And 
it was amazing because all of the objections against positivism that he laid out in his work in ethics, they were dropped when it came to theology. <laughs> so we had fun in that particular area. So it was mere survival. Then we got the development of these new uh, uh, shifts in epistemology and extraordinary defenses of the Christian faith. Um, I'll not rattle off the names, but I think uh, you can, you can, we can follow those up later. Then what we've got, God help us, analytic theology. Now, some of us were doing this way back earlier, but, you know, Notre Dame, you get a hold of Notre Dame, put a bunch of evangelicals in Notre Dame. Presbyterians, they've got to be reformed, because they know the money is. And they know how to worm their way into those institutions that give out money, and some of us are the beneficiaries of this. And what you've now got is the philosophers have started doing theology. It's an amazing development. It'll be a mixed bag, but that's another issue. And then, tell it not in Gath, the other crucial development is the development now of a new subdiscipline, which uh, I've been working on with some of my students, called the epistemology of theology. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean we've got resources that we've not had for generations in terms of thinking through alternative possibilities for the full-scale defense of the Christian faith. And I can assure you, when I was trained, that was not available. And I think it's, I think it's just fantastic that that's the case. Now, for those of you who have been work, working in the postmodern world, there are other developments over there that parallel this. And I would particularly recommend to you uh, my good friend uh, Cyril O'Regan over at uh, Notre Dame on this. Uh, he's, he's got more of a problem with uh, zipping it than I do. Um, but we get to the point where he could start a sentence and I can finish it. And he's in the bogs, and he's from the back streets in Limerick and a Roman Catholic, and I'm from the bogs of the north and a Protestant, and we're going to do the two Irish tenors before we're done <laughs> on these developments. But what I want to get at is, is that the shifts that have gone on within philosophy give us a wing, we've got a, a, a tailwind that I don't think we've had for a long time. And I think it's very important that Christian intellectuals and universities be aware of it. Now, uh, two other, uh, well, yeah, let me make sure I don't go over time here. Um, two other quick things. Not only has there been these remarkable shifts in philosophy, I think the re-engagement, and here is a word to the historians, <clears throat> the re-engagement <clears throat> with patristic and medieval Christianity which has emerged over the last 30 to 40 years, is astonishing. Now, um, you want to see this? Look at the material developed by Tom Oden, Thomas Oden. Now, uh, Tom and I are good friends, so we can talk, you know, Turkey and straightforwardly. Tom was committed to so many fads, including the time when he was teaching at Perkins, that he decided never to have another original thought of his own. Now, that's a naive thing to think, but we'll leave it there. But he's done this amazing service in retrieving patristic material on scripture, patristic material on, on the early fathers and whatnot. And we now are at the point where our access to this material, you know, real good access to this material, is a, is a real possibility. Now, why do I think this is important? And again, I'm going to just be personal with this. Because we live in a bubble. Now, I don't care whether it's a modern bubble or a postmodern bubble. We're in a bubble. And in my judgment, the way out of that bubble is to go back and be tutored afresh by the tradition. And we've now got the resources to work on that, I think, that we didn't have before. In my own case, um, I've been working on issues of divine agency and divine action for 40 years. And I'm bringing that now to fruition in a number of volumes. And my second volume will take it up to Wesley. Because I think after Wesley, uh, Wesley's this crucial transitional figure. And after Wesley, we're really deep into the modern and then on into the postmodern world. But what I think is crucial at this stage is not we're going to do a microwaving operation. You can't just take this stuff and put it in the microwave and, and go with it. But we can be tutored and informed by resources that we've not had in a many, many years, as far as I'm concerned. And then the last sort of move that I, I see is a tremendous shift in the wind, which was mentioned by your president. Look at the fresh recovery of material on spiritual formation, on catechesis, 
and on discipleship. Now, there are two elements here. One is the, just the recovery of the historical material. Um, one of my own students, uh, a PhD student who's from Russia, he, he didn't tell me he was doing this. He was doing a, a book or doing a thesis on the suffering of the impassable God. And on the quiet, <laughs> he wrote a book in Russian on catechesis in the early church, been translated into French, not available yet in English. But the early churches went out, I mean, the early world was like Southern California. And if you're going to spread the Christian faith in that world, you're going to have to do formation. You're going to have to do catechesis. I don't care what you call it. You're going to have to make disciples. And now that is a massively sort of significant theme in contemporary education. And then the issue is how we're going to implement that. Uh, I think it's a 20 to 30 year project. Uh, I think it will lead to the development of spiritual direction within Protestantism in ways that are going to be extremely fruitful because a lot of people are going to need one-on-one -on -one help. Um, I have a number of people who show up at my door or show up in my email. I'm working with one guy. He was brought up Roman Catholic. He went fundamentalist. That didn't work. He went to Stanford to do work on computer science. Tried atheism. That didn't work. Now trying to find his way back into the Christian faith. I've been working with him for seven years. Now, I am not a trained spiritual director, but it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge. In fact, it's lovely because he's rich. He's an entrepreneur as well. So he call me up and he will say, uh, let's go to the best hotel in Dallas and we'll buy brunch. And after two and a half hours, I'm completely exhausted. Now, the point I want to get at here is that we are not going to have disciples on the cheap. Um, in Wesley's terms, people are enthusiasts. They want the end without the means. You're going to have to have the means that are going to do the work for spiritual direction, and we're going to have to work on the corporate practices. The experiments there are well known, some of them. But that, it seems to me, is a magnificent change that, that I've witnessed over the last 20 to 30 years. So take these three, philosophy and the shifts that have gone on there, the historical material available to us that we didn't have before, and then I think all of the sort of uh, enthusiasm there is now for spiritual formation. Now how does all this relate? I come back to the final piece here. How does it relate to education and teaching? Again, forgive me, I'm, I'm going to use telegrams, but I, I, want to, I want to throw out there what I think is crucial. How do you distinguish between an educational practice and a non-educational practice? For example, lots of changes are going on in your classroom when you're teaching and giving lectures. You know, you're depleting the uh, money that's available to the university because your salary has to be paid. You're changing the amount of air that there is in the room, uh, hopefully cutting down on the hot air. Right? All sorts of changes are going on in the room when you're teaching. Now, how do you distinguish in all of those things that go on? Like here I am waving my hand, giving a lecture. How do you distinguish between what's education and what's not education? What's something else? Now, in my judgment, some of the best work on this was done actually in the 1960s by Christians who were brethren in London, Paul Hurst in particular and R.S. Peters. And I'm going to give you my appropriation of that and where it's been central in my own teaching and education. The key issue is to put it this way. How do you distinguish the two distinctions between education and training and education and indoctrination? Let's just work with those. Now here's where I want to go. In order to pick out an educational practice, broadly there are three delineating characteristics. One is something valuable has to be passed on by those who are the educators. In that sense, education is inescapably moral in orientation. Now you want a quick and easy, what I'm going to give you a quick and easy uh, proof of this, argument for it. Think of this. I propose to the president that we, we have a new department. A department of crime. So we're going to call up the local mafia and ask for a donation. We want a diamond from them, of course. 
And then we're going to have a whole new section in the curriculum. Uh, we're going to have Crime 101, which is sort of get you into uh, the orientation to be a criminal. And then we'll have special courses, higher level courses, bank robbery, for example, drug peddling, uh, uh, how to steal from the government and not get caught. Now, that's not going to get to first base. And the reason it's not going to get to first base is simple. It's not something that we're going to approve as valuable in terms of content and practices is going to be passed on. So a crucial first move is that in education, something valuable is passed on. Now here's the second. And this has to do with the student and deeply related to our teaching. It has to be passed on in such a way as to be appreciated by recipients, by students. Now again, I'll give you a quick and easy argument in favor of this. <clears throat> Suppose I've got a very sophisticated parrot. I don't. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach it French verbs. And it's really good. I mean, it can rattle off these verbs on cue. Or if you want it in Latin, we'll conjugate the Latin. But what's the problem with this? I've trained it, but it has no appreciation for the beauty of French verbs, or French literature, or Latin literature. So the crucial thing for the student, it's not enough that we simply pass on something that's valuable. We've got to have the skill to do it in such a way that they find the space to appreciate what's passed on in their own terms and personally. And here's the third one, if I may be quick about it. What we pass on needs to be passed on in such a way that it is related to a wider cognitive perspective. Again, let me give you a contrast. Suppose you're not going to do this, but we'll have a course on sex education, and then we'll have a course on sex training. I think of the differences between those two courses. I think on the second one, what you're interested in is, say, erotic technique. So we'll call in Oprah, or whoever else is out there, because the general view of sexual activity in our culture is it's a good indoor sport. So you need to be fit, right? And of course, there are certain constraints, namely, uh, everybody's got to agree with what goes on, and you're not allowed to harm anybody. But you'll notice a course in sex training is not going to be a course in sex education. Because in the case of sex education, you're going to have to relate it to a whole range of other things, from biological development, to family relationships, to bed and breakfast go together, which is a center standard view of Christian marriage, and covenant, and children, and moral development, and fidelity. And you're going to have to relate it to a wider cognitive perspective than simply that would be the case if you had a matter of training. Now, I think where this, I'll not pick up further the issue with how this would relate to indoctrination. Indoctrinators fundamentally want people to believe things regardless of the evidence. And what it, I, all you got to do, and I think we Wesleyans have been doing this from the beginning. Um, if you look at what Wesley did in the schools, what Irish Methodism has done in the schools, I'm simply bringing to the surface what I've learned and, 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 and seen there. So what do we want to do? Aside from all of the other good things that we have, we want to pass on the fullness of the Christian tradition, intellectually, morally, spiritually, and otherwise. Uh, this is no longer will late 19th century revivalistic Christianity do, when all you needed to do was to have an altar call and get them to accept Jesus into their heart, and then they would be safe to go on the hayride. So, we're in a world where uh, that may work in certain places in West Texas, but where you can no longer depend upon the culture to transmit the faith, and therefore we've got the full range of Christian uh, heritage to pass on. And we needed to do it in such a way that students appreciate it. Now this is where I'm uh, an old-fashioned, unreconstructed 18th century pietist. This cannot be done without the help and aid of the Holy Spirit. 
we need to pray as much about what texts we're going to ask students to read, what conversations we're going to have with students as they come into the room, <laughs> into our, our offices, because this is way beyond simply having a set of intellectual, even moral, and educational skills. In order for people to know and understand the de depth and riches of the Christian faith, there has to be the inner presence and power and energy of the Holy Spirit, and that would be a whole other lecture. And then, of course, as we transmit the full riches of the Christian faith, we're going to relate it to all our intellectual disciplines in a way that only those in the disciplines know, as I would say. We're going to relate it to the church and its practices. Um, I, I was asked to teach evangelism, study evangelism. No introductory textbooks. How do you get tenure? Studying and teaching evangelism changed my life. I'll talk about that in the, in the, in the, small, in the other group. It absolutely changed my life. Because what happened was, I discovered, as I read the evangelization of the Roman Empire, that the formation of students led in turn to all the other disciplines that are needed in the life of the mind, and whereby relating what you were sort of grounded in to these other fields and disciplines is an absolutely wonderful and vast topic to be pursued. And not least does this not need to be carried out with relate to politics. So here's, here's my final word. I think that the challenges are ones that we ought to just take on board. The resources are astonishing. The changes in philosophy, the changes in the understanding of the Christian tradition that we now have, and the emphasis on spiritual formation. This is right what we need at this point. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I'll put it this way, we've all got to be engaged in the conversation as to how we sort of implement this and appropriate it. And here, my analogy is a simple one. We go to an Irish pub, and we get tanked up on the spirit. Now, initially what happens is you go out one at a time and you fall in the gutter. Or you hit a lamppost and break an eye. So what we need to do is go back in <laughs> and get a different spirit. I really mean this. And then link arm in arm and figure out a way to make it out the door and make it home. And I think at this stage, in the place where we are in Christian education, higher education, this is our day. This is the time to step up and take on the challenges of our culture, to take on the help we can give to the church, and to take on the formation of students who will truly be salt and light in the world in which God has placed us. So thank you very much. That's my comments for this morning.